Good morning. If you would make your way to your seats, let's begin. Galatians chapter 4 says that, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. To all who are lonely and in need of belonging, and to all who are grieving and in need of comfort, to all who are broken and your need of healing, to all who are in misery and you need mercy, to all who sin and need a savior, this church opens wide her doors in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the friend of sinners. He is the savior of the world. He is the deliverer of God's mercy. He is the only great physician. He is the mender of broken hearts and the one who brings us to the father and makes us his family. He reigns. He is king. He offers us good news to all who call on him and humbly receive him as king. So let us sing. Let us praise him. Let's stand. Well, good morning and, and welcome to Faith Church on this Advent slash Christmas season as we celebrate what is central to all all of the year and every day of our lives, and will be world without end, and that is Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. He is our King. He is our Savior. And if He is not yours, we hope and pray earnestly that you will know Him as, as Savior and Lord. It's great to be with you this morning on this Lord's Day. And this morning, we're, we're going to jump right into a real important aspect of our faith, and that's what's called the Lord's Supper or communion that we're going to take have this morning. And, and so before we do that, I, I, want, I wonder if you ask yourself the question, why is the Lord's Supper so important? I, churches all over practice the Lord's Supper. They might do it in different ways. They might follow different formats. But all true Christian churches have said that baptism and the Lord's Supper are very important to the life of the church. I wonder if you wonder what the, about that. I have two. I actually am going to start giving out these books over the next month or so because I think this is a really important subject. I have a little book here, really small, really helpful. I went through it this morning even. I said, man, this is really rich. It really will help you appreciate. Find these mornings when we have the Lord's Supper, which is almost every third or fourth Sunday, um, much more meaningful as you just take in what it means. This, this is a little booklet called Why is the Lord's Supper So Important? We argue that it is really important. Is there anyone here that say, hey, I think this would be really helpful. Okay, Riker, will you help me pass that back right there? Meet her back there. One, one other. Who else would say, hey, I think this would be helpful to me. I'd really like, okay, I can get you another one, Roy. Uh, to come to me after. And and so, well, so why is the Lord's Supper so important? This morning, we, have you ever found that eating food brings back memories? Certain foods remind you of certain places or times or celebrations. That is true in our lives. Maybe you remember eating this food when you were at grandma's. Well, when we gather to eat with, not, not, a, not right now a real impressive uh, meal when it comes down to the substance of the little elements, but what they symbolize, this bread or cracker and, or wafer or this juice or wine, they remind us of something that is massively important to all of our lives and for eternity. And when Jesus passed, when Jesus led his disciples on the night before he died, he 
told, he reminded them of a Passover meal, of when God's people were redeemed in the Old Testament. And they were redeemed not because they were sinless. They were redeemed because a sacrifice was made and judgment was going to pass over God's people. And instead, go, it went on the lamb that was killed and that blood was put over the doorpost. And Jesus is picturing and pointing us to there is a greater Passover that's going to take place. I'm going to die on the cross and my body dying and my blood being shed will establish a covenant pledge, a relationship, a promise to a people that believe and trust in me that will change their life and I will never let you go. I will forgive you of all your sins. I will promise you eternal life and it changes everything. And when we take this meal now, we are taking upon our lips. We are looking at with our eyes. We are remembering covenant made for me forever and my sins forgiven. And I am brought back to God and he loves me and he's for me. Hallelujah. And so when we do this, let us remember that this that little bread or cracker symbolizes something awesome. And it is that Jesus was killed for me. His body was broken for me. And when we take of that juice, his blood was shed for my forgiveness. Hallelujah. He loves me and will never let me go. But it, meals are also communal in nature. I know we live in an age, and I far too often will grab a lunch if I'm nearby myself, and I'll turn the TV on, and I'll just want to enjoy it for myself. But meals are meant to be times of, of gathering together, and this is the same. This is not a me and Jesus moment. It is something about me and Jesus. But it's about much more than me and Jesus. This is about me and Jesus and you and each other. And so when we gather, there is... We, the bread that we break, we all take part of that same loaf spiritually. The, the covenant that the blood was shed for is all, all of us, not in a bunch of covenants. It's one covenant. And it's in his blood and we're together. And so that's one of the reasons why I like the way we do it. In that instead of passing it out, in just a minute... I'm going to pray, and we're going to sing a song. And while we sing a song, you're going to stand, and you're going to go out the outside aisles, and you're going to come down here, and two of the deacons or elders are going to pass you these elements, and you're going to go back to your seats, and you're going to wait. And you can sit down. I'll make that clear. You can sit down when you get back to your seat, and you can continue singing and thinking, but you can also look at each other and remember you too. God's done that for you too. We're together in this. We've been redeemed and we're together. Jesus didn't just die to save a bunch of individuals, which he did. He died to save, to make a people. A people together, to be a household of faith. And so, enjoy the fact that you're walking down these side aisles and back up again and sitting next to people that... You're going to spend eternity with. God loves them too. He rescued them too. Now, who is this for? It is for all who have been rescued by his blood. And have, have that assurance that they have fully trusted in him. Turning away from their own sins and looking to him. We call it faith in what he did for you. Through Jesus Christ. He died. He rose from the dead. He was your sacrifice. And if you've put your faith and trust in him and he has saved you, we invite you to come. We have one, not addition to it, but it is the biblical mark of having received him is to be baptized as a believer. And so if you have never been baptized, we ask you to get baptized. And, and not so that you'll make us happy, so that you'll obey Jesus and honor him and be really blessed in that. Because that's the initiation mark of being God's people in his covenant. And so, I'm going to invite Dan and Lee, if you'd come up to help serve this communion. On the night in which Jesus 
was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave this Passover meal, he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, take it and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup and he poured it out. And they, they're thinking symbolism of the Exodus, the Passover, the Old Testament deliverance, the shedding of blood, the sacrificial system. And he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is for you. He blessed it. Let, I'm going to bless this. Paul said, we bless this cup and we take it. I'm going to bless this in Jesus' name, thanking him for this. And then you're going to come. We're going to worship, sing, commune with each other and Christ as we begin this worship service. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins through his blood. Thank you for coming and adopting us when we were children of wrath. God, thank you for that. God, if there's anyone here or if there are some here this morning that is not there yet, I pray that they would be because you are drawing them to yourself and they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. God, thank you for this. Feed us, nourish us, and bind us together during this time of communion. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. For those that are coming, please come and let's take communion. Paul says he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace in which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. There is one word that provides a summary of the life and testimony of a Christian. It is grace. From start to finish, our lives are in Christ and are lived by his grace. Grace is not just the defibrillating jolt of the beginning of our Christian life. Grace is the saving and restraining power of God at every stage of our lives. If the Lord were to leave us for one hour, we should fall into gross evil. We are like children who dare to not cross the street of a busy intersection unless he holds our hands. And it's the grace of God that does. The Christian life can be explained by God's sustaining grace that is symbolized now in this communion. We can say that sin abounds in us, but his grace abounds even more in us. We cannot be as good as evil as he actually is good. His power is a perfect match for our weakness. His riches are perfect for our poverty. And so let us come and take, let us rejoice, let us eat in faith, let us drink as we remember what he has done for us. And let us praise him. Let us praise him by giving our offerings. We're going to take a we're going to pass plates now for you to pass your empty trays here. And then we're also going to take an offering. And that's going to go for those that are in special need. We call it our grace offering. And we're going to do that while we sing, O come all ye faithful. Let's adore him. Let us give praise to him. Would you stand? Let's stand and let's sing. Let's bow our hearts in prayer we give this time to the Lord. Father, God, we thank you for who you are in this holiday season. We thank you, God, for your presence with us. We thank you that you are Emmanuel. And Lord, that you have not left us to our own sinfulness and depravity, but rather chose to live amongst us and live perfectly the life that we were called to live and die the death that we all deserved to pay our sin wage, dear God, so that we might have life with you. 
We thank you, Father, for your sacrifice. We thank you, Father, for your love. We thank you, Father, for your compassion and all of the the bountiful ways in which you bless us every moment of every day. We thank you, God, for the breath that's in our lungs this morning. We thank you, God, for the sunshine, the constant reminder to us, God, of the, the sunrise of your smile and the warmth of your grace and your care and your protection and your provision. We thank you, Father, for the ways in which you provide for us. We thank you, God, for our jobs. We thank you, God, for our means to make a living. We thank you, God, for the resources that you've given us each day. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for your truth that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Father, that as we ask for wisdom from you, God, you don't hold back. And you give to all men freely. We thank you, Father, for the ways in which you minister your grace in our lives. And Lord, as we come before you this morning, God, we are a broken people, a a desperate people, a needy people, God. We gather before you, Lord, with humble hearts, with desperate needs. And God, we ask that you would Minister to us in a special way, in a unique way, in a fresh way this morning. Lord, I pray for our church family. God, I pray for physical health amongst our congregation. Lord, we're living in very uncertain times right now. And yet, God, there is nothing more certain than your care for us. And I pray that you keep us healthy, keep us strong. Give us, Lord, the energy that we need to serve you, to love you, to minister your grace and truth amidst a world that doesn't know you, God. We pray for the the spiritual health of our body. Lord, that we would be lovers of your word. That we would be passionate about your truth, God. That it would be the steady diet of our souls, God. That we could not get enough of your words, Lord. That we would delight in it. Above all else, Lord, that as men, we would love our wives as Jesus loved the church, God. That we would, as men, show our families what it means to live lives that are desperately devoted to you. God, that as men, we would would have a fervency and an urgency in the way that we live, God. That you would give us clarity, God, in our priorities, in our choices, in the ways in which We live every moment of every day, God, that you would help us as men to redeem the time because the days are evil, that we would recognize the brevity of life and seek to invest every moment in a way that counts. I pray, God, that as families and as a church family, God, that you would give us a deep and abiding love for you, that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that we would love our neighbors as ourselves, God, that you would enlarge the scope of our impact as a church that you would give us a gospel footprint in this community, God, in our neighborhoods, Lord. I pray that every neighbor we come into contact with would know that we love Jesus. And God, there's so many moments of the day where I live in silence and quiet under the camouflage of my own worldliness, God, hiding, fearful. And I pray, God, that you would In the power of your spirit, help me to bust out of that and to be bold, to be vigilant, to be confident in the gospel and to desperately, God, proclaim your truth to all that I come into contact with. Help us, Lord, as a church to have a large footprint for the sake of the gospel. Help us to be about the right priorities every moment of every day. Lord, there's a lot of things that we can be about. And yet, God, we can neglect the one most needful thing. I pray that the gospel would speak the loudest, God, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace, in our homes, that we would live out its truth every moment of every day. That as husbands, we would lead the way. That our wives would would seek to follow, would, 
would seek to embrace the gospel and, and be the light to our kids and to our families and in our homes and in our neighborhoods. Be with our church, God. I pray for the mission around the world today. I think of the Max and the Stellars and the Davies who are preparing to go to Cameroon. I pray, God, that you would open the way for the gospel in a special way, in a, in a precious way, God, that you would give them energy, God, beyond their own human resources, God. You're calling them to do things that are exhausting and draining and exciting. I pray that you would so energize their souls with your spirit, that you would give them a, a multitasking focus, God, that you would give them a, a unique energy and enthusiasm and partnership, that you would mobilize the mission there in Cameroon, but not only in Cameroon. We pray for Pastor Livingston in India and just the intense difficulties that, that he's facing, God, as he gets attacked from the outside, as, as, as people are speaking ill of him. And Lord, the opposition, both political opposition and personal and relational and all of the challenges, God, that he faces. I pray, God, that you would bolster his confidence in you that you would give the gospel, Lord, the, 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 um, the power to move, God. Help, help him to, to minister your truth in a unique way. And I pray, God, that your words, as they flow out of him, would impact hearts and lives and draw them to salvation. I pray for the Brunos as they're preparing to head to Hawaii. God, care for their needs, provide for them, watch over them, the Bradleys and England and the McMasters and Brazil and all of our missionaries around the world and those who are, who are living out their retirement here in the States, I pray, God, that you would care for their souls, that you would help them to live lives that are on fire for you. God, I pray for our kids today and all of the ministries that are happening today in our church. I pray, God, that you would awaken our kids to the reality of your truth, your love, your, your desire for their lives. Awaken them to a big gospel vision Help them to see you with fresh eyes, God. Give them a God-centeredness in a man-centered world. And God, I pray that you'd help them to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ Jesus, their Lord. Help our teachers today. Watch over them and strengthen them. God, be with Pastor Daniel as he opens the word now this morning. Give him a fresh fire and a zeal for your truth. God, open our hearts to receive your truth. Help us to honor you in all things. God, we will give you all the praise and all the glory for everything you do in us and through us. For it's in Jesus' precious and glorious name we pray these things. Amen. And I invite you to turn to the Psalms. The Psalms, and we're in the 18th Psalm this morning. If you don't have a Bible, we invite you to take one of the black Bibles that should be in one of the chairs in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love for you to take one of our own and write your name in it, make it your own. And it is page, on page 454, or Psalm 18. There's two different versions of those Bibles. And so the bigger one is 454. I'm not sure where the other one is. But please join me by looking at Psalm 18. This past week, I, I visited with a member of our church who had come close to death this year while she was in the hospital for a long stay. She recalled how God drew near to her in a really special way this year and during that season and showed her his special prayer hearing presence and care, not only through God just ministering personally to her heart, but through this church caring for her as well. She told me how God had changed the way that she prayed and thought, dealt with the frustrations in her life, even at work. Her perspective was now different because of the care of a living God who delivered her from her trial in a way that grew her faith. I wonder if you've experienced the deliverance of God in such a way that it changed you. 
I pray that this morning we will draw, draw near to God in such a way and we will see God as a delivering God who is alive and real. Is God alive and real to you this day? Maybe you have experienced a deliverance from God that was life-shaking and changing, but over time you have fallen back into a distant and shallow relationship with God. Psalm 18, I want us to look at an overview of it. This psalm has some background information for us. Look at the, the title right under the label Psalm 18. It says, to the choir master. It's a psalm of David. He is the servant of God, it says, servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of the song to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said these words. And we come to the longest psalm that we have tackled so far. We are in a psalm series, just we've finished James and we're picking up where I left off earlier part of this year and we're in Psalm 18, where there's 17 last week. If the Lord wills, next week we'll be in Psalm 19 and I encourage you to read Psalm 19 throughout the week this week and pray that God will use it in your life and in the life of this church and he will help me as I prepare for next week's message. But today it's Psalm 18. If you were to go into the Old Testament and read from 1 Samuel chapter 16, we find that David is anointed to be the next king of Israel while there was still a king on the throne, King Saul. But you see, Saul had rebelled against God and God had said, I am going to turn away from you and your kingship and I'm going to give it to another, a man after my own heart. And God chose David. He anointed David in 1 Samuel 16. Pastor Mike preached on that not too long ago. And yet from 1 Samuel 6 or 18 all the way into 2 Samuel, we find that King Saul, the current king, wants to kill David out of jealousy and rage. He, has his, he goes after David's life time and time again, threatening and seeking to destroy him. David is delivered over and over again in these Psalms. David flees from the javelin of Saul in the throne room. He escapes in the night from his own house when his wife helps him escape. He hides, from, he hides at the high priest's house. He flees to a mountainous wilderness. He hides in caves. He pretends to be insane before a pagan king. For years, David experiences many ups and downs. His wife and his children are abducted by enemies, and his own little army that he had threatens to assassinate him. And at one point, David, in anger, is about to murder a man who had insulted him, and God delivered David through the intervention of that bad man's wife, Abigail, who he ends up marrying after she becomes a widow. This psalm is written with the context of battles and deliverances and desperation and discouragement and the presence of a living God. The psalmist has written after the death of Saul, the king. And as it says here, on the day in which the Lord delivered David from all his enemies and the hand of Saul. It is a song of praise to God. It is a song of God's care and God's deliverance. And oh, that we would know the God of this psalm, faith church. Oh, that you would know firsthand this God that David sings of and sings to the Lord and it was written down for our encouragement. I believe it is God's will that we would hear these words and have our hearts encouraged to say, when I go through the times which I will have enemies or difficulties or trials or afflictions and I will need deliverance, oh, I need the God that 
of this psalm that I am growing to know. So let's look at this 50-verse psalm, and we're not going to go through it. It's taking a long time on each verse. We don't have time for that this morning, but what I want to do is, in a sense, go through and help you see the terrain by looking at eight different sections of this psalm, seeing the terrain, let's say, of the forest, the terrain of the forest of this beautiful psalm, and then I want to point out some really glorious trees in this forest that point to the God of David. So let's look at this psalm divided up in sections. The sections are actually in the back of your bulletin. Let's begin with number one. We see, first of all, the Lord loved in verses one through three. David said, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Now listen to the joy in these verses. The Lord is my rock. And my fortress and my deliverer, my God and my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. That means the strength of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord and that Lord is capital L-O-R-D. It is the name of the covenant keeping God of Israel. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. What a way to start. I love you, O Lord, my strength. You can read this psalm in first, Second Samuel chapter 22. Dave, it is also recorded there. It doesn't include that first phrase, I love you, O Lord, my strength, which is recorded here. And in great zeal, David says, God is my strength. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. He's my shield. He is the horn of my salvation. He's my stronghold. Put those all together. He's saying, God is everything. He is my strength. And I love you. And remember, he's speaking to God. I love you, O Lord. And it's written in a way for us to all overhear and eavesdrop on this song and say, I need to know this God. That David loves. The Lord loved is. Opens this psalm. And oh that we would know. The the God of David. This way. Friends do you know God this way? Do you know him as your stronghold. And your shield? Do you know him as the one. When in trouble you run to. And he hides you under his wings. As we saw last week. He hides you. And keeps you as the apple of your, his eye. He abun- abundantly cares for you. That's what David begins. Well, it continues. Let's look at section two. In verses four through six, we see the Lord, not, we see the Lord listening. Now, David begins this section by saying what his predicament was, his The jam that he needed to be rescued out of. In a poetical way, he expresses that he was in a narrowing, near-death situations because of his enemies. And he says in verse 4, The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears. David did what God's people do that are believers. He called upon the name of the Lord. He cried out to God for help. David is in a place where he describes him as I am dying or I'm in threat of death. And frankly, he cries out to him and says, unless you save me, I am a goner. And God hears his cry. Friends, have you been in that place? If you haven't, you will be in that place most likely in your life. We will be in a place and it is not a bad place for us to know our 
mortality, the reality that we are going to die, that death could come tomorrow for even the youngest and the healthiest in this room. And yet David cries out to God and says, God, you are my strength. Please hear my cry. And it says here that the Lord heard him. He reached the Lord's ears. David's going to sing about this. He's going to write about this. He's going to drive it into our hearts over and over in the Psalms, like in Psalm 34, when he says, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and he delivers them out of all their troubles. We see the Lord listening. Then look at verses 7 through 15. There are strange verses here, and I'm going to label it the Lord responding. The Lord responding. Look at verses 7 through 15. They are somewhat puzzling. What are they doing here? They're interesting, the way they describe what God, how God responds. It says here, then the earth, so in response to David crying out and God hearing, then the earth reeled and rocked the foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. There's an earthquake. Smoke went up from his nostrils. It sounds like a, a dragon. The devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. Here's this image of God coming. And he rode on a cherub. Angels. Mighty angels. And flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds dark with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord thunder also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire, and he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. Do you see the Lord, powerful, mysterious, mover of heaven and earth? And in these verses, if you were to, you go back to 1 Samuel and start to read the life of David and all his deliverances, you don't find this going on. What, where was the earthquake? Where was this fire coming from heaven? Where was there, this dark clouds coming over and God riding on like, it, like he was riding a chariot and those that were propelling the chariot are cherubs? You don't see that going on. You don't see this fire coming out of God's nostrils. Why is Dave, what's David doing here? This is a poetical way. This is a biblical way of often speaking of this God is large. And even though we do not see him, he is moving and living and powerful. And when he moves and he comes, he is a earth changer. He is he changes all things. Here we find imagery of things that took place at the Exodus with God's people, at the Red Sea when he divided it, at Mount Sinai and his darkness presence coming down in the smoke. This is a powerful picture of God's, of David saying, the Lord responded. And when God responded, that's all that matters. This is a God who is alive and powerful and amazing. David wants us to see this is the same God that was at work when he delivered his people from Israel. The same God that brought his people to Mount Sinai and made a law with him and showed him that he is holy, holy, holy. And appeared with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And he is the God of David. I believe that he wants us to see that he is the God that is moving and alive today. Then we see the next section, section four, the Lord rescuing, the Lord rescuing. Look at verses 16 through 19. In some ways, 16 and 19 are the interpretation of what God did in 17, 7 through 15. If that's the figurative and picture, pictorial way of God working beside, the, beside that in a spiritual way, we find this is what God actually did for David. Verses 16. 
He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me. And they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. And in these verses, he describes this rescuing. He drew me out of waters. A picture often in the Old Testament of a place of great peril. When God takes us out of the waters, he's delivering us. He rescued David from his strong enemies. He says, the Lord is my support. I I encourage you to think and read on the many deliverances of David from being in a wilderness, ready to be destroyed. And Saul is right there with his two armies kind of divided and ready to surround David. And they hear word that the Philistines have attacked again and they have to leave and God is delivered. I mean, David is delivered by God through providence. We find time and time again, David being saved and delivered And we find here at the end when David is finally delivered, he has made the king of Israel. He says, God drew me out of the waters and delivered me. Section five, we keep moving on. Not only do we find the Lord rescuing, we find the Lord rewarding. Look at verses 20 through 24. The Lord dealt with me, David says, according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept all the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me and his statues I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him. I kept myself from my guilt. From my guilt. So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. I was asked just recently through a text a couple weeks ago, hey, in another psalm where it seems like God is rewarding according to the work of his hands. And he said, but doesn't God save us by grace? Yes, he does. He also rewards the righteous. And you say, but I thought our righteousness is as filthy rags. Doesn't it say that somewhere in the Old Testament? Yes, it does. But not the righteousness that now comes from having faith in God and obeying him in faith There is a sense in which the New Testament says we are righteous by his help and by his grace in our lives. And David here is saying God is the rewarder. Now God chooses to reward in his way. And sometimes we are righteous. We are doing the right thing and we will receive injustice till the day we die. But in this case, God said, I'm going to reward you on this earth. And God David, who sought to be faithful, who honored the Lord's anointed and would not even kill Saul when he had an opportunity to protect himself. And he could have easily said, it's self-defense, God. No, he trusted God in his way. It says he kept his rules. He kept his law before him. The Bible says that God is the rewarder of those who seek him. Hebrews eleven six in faith. David was saved by grace and grace alone. David did not earn the merit of his salvation in his life. But David in this passage is saying, but God, you were gracious to me. And I saw in your way that as I honored you and sought to be faithful, trusting in you and doing the right thing and going by your law and your testimony and not taking the law into my own hands, you have dealt with me in a way that has rewarded me For the cleanness of my hands, I did not seek to take vengeance. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish, Psalm 1 says. David rejoices, the Lord rewarded me. This is not the cry of some self-righteous person who just thinks they're just better than everyone else. And so God's just doing what he should do. He is graciously thanking God for faithfully keeping his promise as he has mercifully looked to God and been faithful. We need, see in this, so we see the Lord rewarding in verses 20 through 24. And we need, see the sixth section, the Lord's ways in verses 25 through 30. 
He says, look at the Lord's ways. Look at his, the way in which he works with people. With the merciful. Now he's addressing God. With the merciful, you show yourself mercy, God. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, that is those who break God's law and just do their own thing, you make yourself seem torturous. For you save a humble people. But the haughty eyes you bring down, for it is you who light my lamp. The Lord, my God, lightens my darkness. For by you, I can run against a troop. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. You, David wants us to see, hey, do you want to know the ways of God here? This way, his ways are perfect perfect. They are blameless. They are never wrong. David could say, God worked with, it was a mystery to me far too often. God, why are you doing it this way? But I now come on the other side and say, God, your way is perfect. You show yourself merciful to the merciful. You are torturous to those who would go their own way. You have been my light. You have been my shield as I've sought refuge in you. And this is the ways of God. He would want the people of Israel and he would want us. God wants us to hear today the ways of God. They're perfect. And then we move on to a longer section in verses 31 through 42. Labeling it section 7 of this terrain of Psalm 18. And we find the Lord's provision. A lot of these verses, they, these categories are not strong and hard. They overlap with one another. You see God's provision already happening. The Lord is my strength. But we find here in verses 31 through 42, the psalmist says, Who is God but the Lord? Who is, who is our rock except our God? The God who is, he's provided for me. He equipped me with strength and he made my way blameless. I'm blameless and I received a reward for my blameless. That doesn't mean sinless perfection. It just means I, I, I went God's way and I didn't choose the path of a disobedience. I, when I sinned, I repented. But he says, you made my way blameless. Verse 32. He made my feet like the feet of a deer. He set me secure on the heights. This idea... Like a deer who could stumble and fall. Instead, God protected him and kept him from slipping. He trains my hands for war, verse 34, so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me a shield of your salvation. Your right, right hand has supported me. Your gentleness has made me great. You have gave me a wide place for my steps under me. and My feet did not slip. And I pursued my enemies and overtook them. And I did not turn back until they were consumed. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me. And those who hate me, I hated me, I destroyed. They cried for help, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine as dust before the wind. I cast them out like the mire of the streets. Now, the Psalms talk this way, and you could, without the right context, you could say, do I pray that for my enemies? And the reality is we are not kings of a nation over in fighting the battles that God has called us to battle battle against literal armies. David was. David's now speaking against whether it be the Philistines that he's fighting or different armies that are threatening to attack God's people. And he, under the sanction of God, is fighting the Lord's battles. And he's saying, I trusted in you and you provided for me. And I defeated the enemy as you had promised because you are faithful and you're raising up your king for your purposes, God. And he says, the Lord was my provision. He equipped me with strength, David says. He kept my way blameless. He trained my arms for battle. He gave me a shield of salvation. His right hand supported me. We come to the last section, and I want you to see the, not only the Lord's provision in the second, seventh section, but the eighth section, the Lord's king. The Lord's king. 
Because as we come to the end of this psalm, we find that this is clearly a psalm, a royal psalm. It's a psalm about the king, specifically the king that God has established. In verse 43, you delivered me from strife with the people. You made me the head of the nations. People who I had not known served me. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of the fortresses. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation. The God who gives me vengeance and subdues people under me, who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from all violence. For this I will praise, O Lord, among the nations and sing to your name. Great salvation. He brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. And in 2 Samuel 7, God made a promise to David that he will allow his his kingship to reign forever. And that promise was to be fulfilled ultimately in the Messiah, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. But we find here David saying, the Lord's king is being exalted and lifted up. I, David, would say, God, you promised that you would make me the king and a king that would be great. And this is not for my sake that I rejoice, but for your sake, because you are keeping your promises and you have given me victory over my enemies and you have exalted your king and so for you, God, to do your purposes. And for that, David rejoices and prays the Lord. And he says, the Lord reigns. He is alive. He is king. And he gives the victory. If we had time, we could spend, and I encourage you to spend time pondering 1 Samuel chapter 2, the very beginning of 1 Samuel, when it begins way before the life of David, we find the story of Hannah who can't have a child and then God gives her Samuel and in chapter 2, after being given a child in Samuel and she's going to give Samuel back to the Lord, she sings a song, it's called Hannah's Song and it is so glorious. It rings with songs of Elizabeth and it's songs of Mary in Luke chapter 1. But it's, song, it's a song of prophecy that God would exalt through hum- humility. He would take the humble and he would lift them up. And he would anoint and strengthen his king way before there was ever a king in Israel. It's a picture of both David and someday Jesus. Now, what do we see in this psalm? 50 verses. I, it was a mountain to climb for me this week to just tackle these 50 verses. And if for you to just sit here in a service, I encourage you to read that. I encourage you last week to read this. I hope you did. I hope you'll do this this week. What would God have for us as we ponder? We just eight stanzas, eight sections of this beautiful, beautiful psalm. And I encourage you to take it and you'll find throughout this psalm promises and statements revelations about God that should cause you to cling to. But this morning, I I call you to behold David's God. The God that David puts down, rejoices in, writes down in writing so that it's recorded today. The, The God that David sings to on the day in which he is delivered. This psalm is written for our benefit, for us to go. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are children of God, you will have, you will face difficulties and trials. You will face afflictions and troubles. You need the God of David in your life. You need the God that's living and proud, living and real and alive in these verses. And so as we wrap up this psalm, I want you to see some glorious truths about God this morning. I want to call you to them. We, we need to be a people at Faith Church. All Christians need to be. If you're visiting here, you need this as well. We need to be a people that are so gripped by these truths, the truths of who God is in this psalm. Do you see this God in this psalm? I pray that you'll see. I pray that the Spirit will give you eyes to see the God in the psalm. I wrote down a few of the things that I saw about God's 
about God. First of all, do you see that he's personal? David says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. I have sat with some of you who have been afflicted and gone through trials, and you would say to me, Pastor, he has been my strength. Oh, that he'd be your strength. That he would be your God, personally caring for you. He says, he is my strength. He is my support. He is my rock. He is my stronghold. He's my refuge. And this is not a selfish, me first kind of mentality. He's just saying, I'm so thankful. He's not just abstract and out there and theoretical. He has come and he has changed my life. And that is the God of the Bible who comes and he takes small people like you and me that are insignificant when you look at the whole scheme of things and he cares for us and he personally ministers to us. He says, who is a God but the Lord and who is a rock except our God? Is he personally for you? Oh, I pray that he would be. And do you see, not only is he personal, he is alive in the psalm. He's alive in all of God's word, and he is alive today. Psalm, verse 46a, he says, The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock. Oh, that we would know that this God, friends, he lives. He lives in your street. He lives in in your house. He lives in your soul. If you put your trust in Christ in a special way, he abides by his spirit. He is alive. He is a God who answers prayer to all who call on him in the name of Jesus Christ. He is alive today. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is the God of Adam and he is the God of Noah and he is the God of Abraham. He is the God of Jacob and of Moses. He is the God of Joshua. He is the God of Samuel. He is the God of David. He is the God of Hannah and he is the God of Ruth and Naomi. He is the God of Esther. He is the God of Sarah. He is the God of Rahab. He is the God of Mary and Joseph. That same God is alive today. He's alive in this church. He is he he works just like he worked in David's life and he moved and he cared for him. Oh, that there there is nothing more important for our children our teenagers, children that are back practicing or not even here this morning, for them to know that there's a living God and they see that living God at work in a mom and a dad or the adults of this church who sing like he's alive, who pray like he's alive, who actually believe this Bible is his word and act and, and therefore act upon it and obey him like he's alive, know that they're going to give an account to him Like he's alive. Oh, this world, your neighbors, your co-workers, your friends who are not saved so desperately need you to believe that he's alive and live like it. Because David did. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Oh, that we would know through the Psalms by his spirit, this living God. But he is alive and he is savior. This, the saving nature of God is throughout this psalm, throughout the entire Bible. Exalted be the God of my salvation, he says in verse 46. Or verse 30, he is the shield for all who take refuge. He drew me out of many waters, verse 16. Verse 17, he rescued me from my strong enemy. Verse 19, he rescued me because he delighted in me. Oh, we need this living God who saves his people. Oh, has he saved you first and foremost by rescuing you from your sins? We call it being saved. Has he saved you? Oh, if he hasn't, I invite you to be saved today by the only way possible. And it is through a a message called the good news that Jesus Christ came into the world as a savior and On Christmas, he came to save his people from their sins. And you become his people by acknowledging that you are so bad that you need to be saved. That he's the only one who can save you. 
that he did it by dying on the cross to pay for your sins and for forgiveness and to make you a child of God if you will turn away, forsake them and ask God to forgive you and accept him as your savior. He saves you. And when he does that, he pledges himself forever to you. And he becomes your ongoing savior in this life. And when he doesn't deliver you from cancer, he is saving you because he is preparing you for glory. And when he saves you from cancer or any trials, he's doing it to grow your faith in him to know that he is personal and he's alive. He is a saving God. And we see that in this psalm. There's so many more that I could just, I want to woo you with. He is our strong God. Oh, Lord, I love you. You're my strength. Oh, this world needs to see Faith Church as people who, weak in ourselves, have God as our strength. It is, it is not me, but it is you, God. I am blameless only through you. And I know I'm a sinner, but I am saved by your grace. You are my stronghold, he says in verse 2. Verse 7, the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations trembled. Why? Because God is mighty. He shakes the earth. The world thunders because of God. The Most High utters his voice and hailstones come forth. The channels of the sea are laid bare. The earth is shown before him because he is God. Oh, God is strong and he is able to meet every one of your needs today. Cry out to him. Make him your strength because he you have no strength apart from him. Look to him. We see also in the psalm that he is wise. He is wise. Verse 30, as for God, this God, his way is perfect. David had a lot of questions probably. And I know he had literal questions throughout the psalms. Why God? How long, O oh Lord? Why are you so far away, O oh God? And then God comes and rescues him. You see, God was strengthening and growing David. God's way was wise. God's timing was perfect. God, God anointed him in 1 Samuel 16 and allowed him to go through many years of struggles and near-death experiences. So God would teach him that God and God alone was his savior, his strength. He was personal and alive. And so he does that in our own lives. I love this statement. The life of a godly is not the straight line to glory, but we get there. The life of the godly person is not an interstate through Nebraska, but it's more like a state road through the Blue Ridge Mountains of Tennessee. In our lives, there are rock slides and precipices and dark mists and bears and slippery curves and hairpin pin turns that make you go backwards in order to go forwards. That's what our life is often like, and that's what it was like for David. But all along this hazardous, twisted road that doesn't let you see very far ahead, there are frequent signs and they're, they're marked in the word and by a spirit and through the family of God encouraging each other. And those signs say, the best is yet to come. And the Lord lives. His way is perfect. Trust him. Oh, that God would help us. Help us to see this God who is personal and alive and saving and strong and wise and true. Oh, friends, you can trust him. You can bank on it. He will keep his promise. David says, great salvation he brings to his king. He sh shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. Why can D David say that with confidence? It's because God had promised him that. And in verse 30, he says, the word of the Lord proves true. 
God is a promise-keeping God. He is absolutely trustworthy. You can bank on every promises that he makes in this book. He has. Christmas is about God keeping his promises. The communion service we just had of the Lord's Supper is about God keeping his promises. We need to grow the rest of our lives to say, what are his promises? What has he said to me? Do I believe it? Will I bank my life on it? Lastly, I want us to see that the picture of David and of David's God is a picture of David's son who would come a thousand years later. The God of David gives us a picture of a greater king who will gather his enemies. This king will gather his enemies by either destroying them, the judgment, or bringing them into his kingdom. He is a personal king who will come and makes family out of enemies. He is alive, this king, having been raised from the dead after being crucified to make atonement for our sins and deliver us and be our savior. His strength is unmatched. He came down in the flesh. Who can do that? He overcame all temptation to sin. None of us can do that. He bore our sins on the cross. None of us could do that. He rose from the dead and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He is the all wise king who rules with perfect wisdom and we can always trust Jesus Christ. He keeps his promises. He is the promise keepingness of God. He will save all who come to him. There's a verse in this psalm that says, out of God's gentleness, he made David great. Out of the gentleness of Jesus Christ, who is gentle and lowly, he comes near to us and makes us great in this sense. We become his children. We become children of God. The Christmas mystery Coming to, coming to pass, the angel said to Joseph, your wife Mary will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. This, the message brought in Luke chapter two, for unto us is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Oh, may we take Psalm 18 on our hearts and see Jesus, our deliverer, our strength, our rock. And may we, each one of us, either for the first time or for the 10,000th time, say, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Let's pray. Father, oh God, as we... And with song, I pray that we would, with all our heart, cry out to you and praise you because you are our rescuing God. I pray that you would convert those that have not yet seen Jesus this way yet. And I pray that you would strengthen us this Christmas season, this year, this decade, to be the type of people that come to know the living God in this way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we go our ways and, and gather again this evening, I hope that you're able to join us. I, I want to invite you to not just, if you're, if you're new to Faith Church, not to just visit us right now and take in the service, which we're really glad you're here. We want to know how we can get into your lives more and pray for you and connect with you. And so if you take a card and fill it out and give it to us, there's one way you can just hand it to one of the leaders. You can give it to me or you can put it in. There's a box in the back where we take our offering and you can put it in there as well. We're glad you're here. Um, there are a lot of things going on over the next weeks. And we, as we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and just grow together as a family. One of them is tonight, you saw some decorating, you saw some tables when you came in the front lobby is because tonight we are gathering for a Christmas program for our children at six o'clock. And we hope that you, whether you have children 
literally in your home or grandchildren from your home that are going to be here, if you're part of this church, your children are in a program because they're your children too. We're together as a, a, a spiritual family and we can enjoy together this program. I hope you're able to join us at six o'clock. Following that time will be just a time of refreshments and fellowship. And so I hope you're able to join us tonight at six o'clock. And then this Wednesday, we're going to gather, not for our normal Wednesday gathering, but all ages are going to be together in the auditorium. It's called Cookies and Carols. We're going to have cookies at the end, and again, for fellowship. But what we're going to do is, look, um, Larry Burke is going to lead us in a time of singing. We'll have song, Christmas carol song books. And we're all going to stay in the auditorium. You're going to pick out your favorites. We're going to sing together. It'll be a good time as a church family. I hope you're able to join us um, and that's going to be at 7 o'clock. So 6 tonight, 7 on Wednesday night. And then uh, one other thing to invite you to, is, or at least this week, um, is there, there are some families that are getting together this coming Friday night here at the church from 5 to 8 for a potluck. And it's in the bulletin as well for a potluck. And there's going to be family activities for kids specifically. Anyone's invited you're all invited, but it's going to be especially for families with kids. They're going to have like, they want to, there's a sign up out here so we get enough supplies for like making gingerbread houses. And so just a time together as family, I hope that as families, hope you're able to come or some of you, maybe it's a new way for you to connect and get to know some people. And, and then the last thing that I'll mention in regards to our services, special to Christmas. Obviously we have services next two Sundays, but on Christmas Eve, which is a Friday at 4 p.m., we'll gather together to worship Christ. We'll gather together and have a time of celebration of what he has done together as a church family here at 4 o'clock. It'll be about an hour service as we gather and worship. And then we do that at 4 so that many people are able to, after that, go and have maybe their own family traditions as they gather together in the evening on Christmas Eve evening. And so that'll be on at four o'clock on Christmas Eve, the 24th. Here is a benediction and it comes from Psalm 18, our Psalm right now. I'm gonna turn it into a benediction. May God save us by making us a humble people and may he cause his light to shine and light our lamp and may the Lord lighten our darkness and may, by the Lord's strength, we run against the troop and leap over the walls he calls us to. And may he cause us to see that his way is perfect and that his word always proves true. And that he is a shield for all who take refuge in him. And may all God's people say, Amen. you are dismissed.